What we've done so far is that we've looked at probability distributions, we looked at a little bit of random variable theory, and we've got a good sense of what you can do with a distribution, what kind of questions you can ask from a distribution. And I exemplified that with the DPQR functions for several examples that I showed you. And then what I did was I showed you an example of analytical base. That means doing the analyses on paper, right, without any computer, you can derive the posterior distribution of the means. A posterior distribution of the parameter, I mean. So what's interesting for us, however, is that these analytical examples are very good for developing intuitions about Bayes, but what we really need to do in real life when we have large amounts of data or very complex, complex data with a complex structure, we need computational tools because we cannot do the analytical analyses anymore, right? We'll have to do this computationally in real life. So that's what the rest of this course is about, okay? So I will start talking about this now. And so just to remind you, we started off with Bayes' rule, right? In the discrete case, when there are discrete events, I had Bayes' rule written down as an equation one. And then I showed you Bayes' rule written down when you're talking about probability distributions, so probability density functions. And I gave you an example where, or a couple of examples, where we had a single parameter to work with. You know, like in the beta binomial, we had the theta parameter. In the Poisson gamma, we had the lambda parameter. So life was easy, and we could do these analyses on paper. But what will happen, as I mentioned earlier, in real life is that we will have dozens, maybe hundreds of parameters, right? So theta is no longer a single parameter, it's a vector of parameters. So that's why I'm writing it in bold phase theta, right? So that will be the normal situation. And in that situation, the, uh, the problem is gonna be that we will no longer be able to calculate a posterior distribution for a single parameter because there isn't a single parameter, there are many parameters. So we're gonna get the joint distribution. Now we are talking about multivariate distributions, right? We're gonna get a joint distribution for the parameters when we look at the posterior distribution of this bold phase theta here, okay? So that's where we are going now. And our central focus, you know, in data analysis is gonna be trying to interpret the posterior distributions of each of the parameters. That's going to be where all the action's gonna be, okay? So I'm going to explain all this with some examples. But before I do that, I wanna quickly remind you about what we have done so far and what we have achieved with the Poisson gamma conjugate case, right? What happened there? We had a likelihood function defined for the data that we're getting in, discrete regressive, you know, counts of regressive eye movements in eye tracking data, and we chose the Poisson likelihood for that, right? So that's the likelihood shown here, right? And we chose a gamma prior for the lambda parameter in the Poisson likelihood, and we chose some uh, values for A and B, right? And so what we did, if, what I actually did last time was that in the last lecture was that I simply multiplied these two kernels, right? So these are the full uh, probability density functions for the, uh, the likelihood and for the prior, but um, what I pointed out last time was that some of these terms, like this denominator here, this b to the power of a and gamma a, these are all going to be constants because these are all fixed numbers, right? So we can remove these from the picture because they end up being the normalizing constants. So really what we're interested in is the posterior distribution of lambda up to proportionality, and the way we are going to do that is by taking only those terms that involve lambda, right? Because lambda is the variable here that we're gonna look at. So what I showed you last time was that all I literally have to do is to multiply this term with the kernel of this uh, prior here, right? So what would that look like? I, I wrote it up quickly in, um, in, um, uh, on my blackboard. And so if you notice what's going on here is that this term looks very complicated, right? But it's actually not because you've got this lambda term here and you've got another lambda term here. So what is lambda sum of x multiplied with lambda a minus one, right? That's an easy addition because these are just exponents. I'm going to just say sum of x, sum of x plus a minus one gives me the result of that calculation. And what about these exponential terms here? These are also easy because I've got exponent 
minus n times lambda, that's the first one here in the likelihood, and then I've got this term here, right, that's in the prior, which is the exponent minus uh, b lambda, right? And so how would I rewrite that? I just again have to, because these are exponents, I just have to add them up, right? So I get exponent minus n lambda minus b lambda, right? And so I could simplify this even further by saying exponent minus lambda n plus b, right? So that's how I got, uh, got to the point, right? So by doing these simple additions on the exponents, that's how I got to the point that I simplified the posterior distribution up to proportionality with this term. And what what's interesting here, you know, the reason that it's called a Poisson gamma conjugate case is that the prior has uh, the form of the gamma distribution. So the kernel is obviously uh, belongs to the gamma distribution over here. But interestingly, the posterior also ends up having the same form as a gamma distribution. So what I'm looking at here is the kernel of a new gamma distribution with updated A and B parameters. So what are those updated parameters? If I just look at this, right, you can see that this looks exactly like a gamma distribution with a new A parameter, which is sum of x plus a and and the b parameter is b plus n. That's how I say, that's how I came to the conclusion, right, that my updated uh, a and b parameters in the posterior for lambda are these terms here, right. This is what the story was up till now and we did this all by hand, like we didn't have to use any computing tools for this, right. And so you can visualize this with a it's always useful to come up with, you know, concrete examples to understand how this plays out in practice, right? So I showed you an example where we had a prior with an A and B parameter 6 and 2 in, uh, on lambda, and I got some data, independent data, and we computed the posterior last time, and we got a posterior for lambda that was 27, with A and B being 20 and 7 respectively, right? And so you can visualize these two priors, right? The prior and the posterior can be visualized quite easily, right? And this code will be, of course, available to you to play with later on. So you can see that the, the prior, which is in red here, right, is much more spread out, it's more to the left, and once the data come in, the posterior for the lambda parameter gets a bit tighter, and it moves to the right a little bit. So that's the effect of the data. The, uh, the data has updated our belief about this lambda parameter, and the belief about the lambda parameter is, is expressed in terms of the probability density function, the, the PDF associated with lambda, right? So that's the whole big deal about the Bayesian approach. You start with some prior, you get some data, and this data updates your prior and gives you the posterior distribution. Okay, so that's the key idea here. Now, once you know what the posterior is, so in this case it was gamma 27, right? So once you know what the posterior is, you can ask interesting questions about that distribution. And that's why I showed you those dpqr functions, because now you can use the q gamma function for the posterior distribution, which with shape and rate uh, 20 and 7 respectively. So these are the a and b parameters. And you can find out what is the range of a value such that I'm 95% sure that the lambda value lies within this range, right? So this is called a 95% credible interval. It's discussed in great detail in the textbook, but what this is giving you, this is one of the big deals about the Bayesian approach, is that gives you an uncertainty interval. So you can think about how unsure you are about this parameter after you've seen the data, right? So this is a very valuable piece of information the uncertainty, right? And in fact, you will see in textbooks that Bayesian data analysis is characterized as uncertainty quantification. This is an example of that. We're quantifying the uncertainty about this parameter here, okay? But what I want to show you here is that what I'm doing right now, what I just did here, is that I have an analytical form for the posterior on lambda, and so I can now compute the quantiles, etc. But it could, I could easily have done the same thing if I just had samples from the gamma distribution with A equal to 20 and B equal to 7, right? If I just had a large number of samples, let's say 4,000 samples, right, I could still get the same credible interval approximately. So let me show you how that works, right? So suppose I had 4,000 samples from a gamma distribution. Here I'm using the R gamma function, okay? So the DPQR family strikes again. And here's my posterior uh, specification of A and B. And what I get here is posterior samples of the lambda uh, 
parameter and this is just a vector now okay of samples coming from this uh, random samples coming from this gamma distribution with a particular parameterization right and so what i can now do is i can use the quantile function right and figure out the 95% credible interval that i just computed analytically this is the analytical analysis this is analysis computing the same interval using uh, samples from the posterior distribution, right? So the reason I'm showing you this is that in real life data analysis, we cannot do this analytical calculation and get a posterior distribution with a particular parameter, right? We don't know what the exact form of the distribution is, but what we can get through MCMC sampling, right, is the samples from the posterior distribution, and we can always figure out you know, the 95% credible interval or any other statistic, right, from the posterior once we have these samples. And our focus will always be on these samples which will be delivered to us by software, okay? So we don't have to do any more analytical work. This is the good news, right? Okay, so when I say looking that we will look at the posterior samples from now on, this is what I mean. We have some samples from a posterior distribution and we're gonna do some statistics on on those posterior distributions, which will be a vector, right, for each po parameter, and we can draw our inferences about that parameter from um, that um, from the samples. Okay, so that's the point here. All right. So one uh, little aside I have is that in in lecture two three on slide eight, I had accidentally said that said that the parameters a and b of the gamma distribution correspond to the shape and scale. What I actually meant was shape and rate, right? So I have corrected that in the slides. But I just wanted to remind you that there's, a, there's several different parameterizations of the gamma distribution. One is in terms of scale and the other is in terms of rate. So scale is one over rate, right? So you can rewrite the distribution in terms, terms of one over lambda instead of lambda. So m people do it differently depending on you know, what their needs are for the gamma distribution. So that's why there's multiple ways to write the gamma distribution in R uh, and in mathematics but we are going to use the shape and rate parameters in the, disc in the discussion that I'm doing about the gamma, okay? All right, so that's just a small detail uh, that you need to pay attention to. So what I wanna talk about now is to, I wanna come back to the point that our main goal will always be obtaining the posterior distribution or posterior distributions of the parameters that we are interested in, okay? So there could be just one parameter, like in the toy examples I showed you, or they could be literally hundreds of parameters, right? We can still get the posterior. It scales up very beautifully. And we'll be getting these posteriors using some sampling method to get the posteriors for each of the parameters, and th these are the MCMC methods. We don't need to know anything about the details of MCMC sampling in this course because the software takes care of it. But later on, if you want to get into the details and write your own samplers, right? Sometimes one has to write customized samplers. In those cases, you would have to learn a little bit, but it's not really that complicated. You, the book that I mentioned by Lambert will help you there, okay? All right, so now let's look at a concrete example, you know, of how would I do such a computational data analysis? Now I'm not doing analytical work. Now I'm using a tool, the BRMS package, right, in R. So let's say I have data from a single subject whose only task is to sit at the computer and keep pressing the space bar, okay? So they're just pressing the space bar repeatedly, and I'm only recording on the computer the amount of time they take before they start, they press the space bar and release it, right? So it takes 141 milliseconds in the first, uh, uh, first trial, then 138 milliseconds, and so on. So that's what this RT column contains. It contains reading time or reaction times to this button pressing that we are doing, right? It's completely a mindless task. It's just a mindless button pressing task, okay? All right, so the responses are in milliseconds, okay? So these are the responses we are getting in each trial, and we would like to know how long it takes to press a key for this subject, let's say on average, and how much variability there is in this subject's key pressing, right? So first of all, of course, you should always look at the data to see what uh, what you're going to model. This is the data that we're gonna model. It's, a, it's a, just a probability distribution, and you see that roughly it's about 180 milliseconds or something like that, and there's a long tail here, right? This is very interesting that there's a long tail, a few rare data points that are quite long, but most of them are in this range here. So this is what we're gonna try to model now, okay? So we're gonna start with a simple model where we are going to assume, this is of course not a reasonable assumption, but I'll fix this later on. We're going to assume that each of the n data points, n refers to the row, each row in the data frame, right? 
each of those n data points is coming from a normal distribution with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma. So in the next lecture, I'm going to unpack this model for you in a Bayesian framework.